Okay, let's do this. Uh, validity. Now, hopefully you've had a chance to have a look at the reliability uh, screencast. So hopefully you should be coming into this video with a bit of knowledge about validity. But worry not, fellow human, uh, if, you have, uh, if you have not, because I will cover all those bases today. What we're looking at is validity. Um, validity is alongside reliability, um, actually one of, in my opinion, one of the most important terms. Now, if you write, oh my God, Bella, why do you start as soon as I start doing these screencasts? Um, if you, um, <clears throat> she's looking at the foxes. Um, if you struggle to elaborate in your peel, if you, you know, you say a good point and you're really happy, you give maybe a good piece of evidence and you've got my voice in the back of it kind of going on about how you should you know, elaborate and why is this point important. Validity is one of the key terms because most of the time what you are saying is the, the theory is either valid or it's not valid. So you need to be able to use this terminology. You need to be able to use it. What we will be doing is going through the different types, but before that, we need to actually understand what validity is, right? And the best way to describe it is actually accuracy. If a theory has validity, it's an accurate theory. If a measure, if a measure of something like IQ test or something, if a measure of an IQ test has uh, validity, then it's, it accurately measures what it claims to measure. And a measure, by the way, can be anything. It can be an observation of people, right? It can be a psychological test. It can be a psychometric test. Um, but the, the central question, as the, as the slide says, is basically, is it measuring what it claims to measure? If it's a theory, is the theory accurately explaining the behavior that it is trying to explain? So validity is, is a really important term. I-M-O, um, in my opinion, uh, validity is more important than reliability and you're gonna use validity a lot more than reliability. Um, so, for example, is measuring the size of someone's head an accurate measure of intelligence? Well, yes, clearly it is in this case, but in reality, not really. It's probably not accurately is probably not accurately measuring intelligence. Um, so I'm gonna give Bella some treats whilst we do this. Um, so, uh, what, another one here. What would it take to accurately measure uh, weight whilst on a weighing scale? Um, we're clearly in this case, sorry, give me two seconds. Uh, clearly in this case, it would be, um, uh, oh, you wanna get a piece of this now, don't you? Go away, go away. Um, you would have to take off your clothes. You would have to take off your shoes. Um, you would have to have gone for a poo. Um, all of these things are going to increase the accuracy of weighing scales in this case. That's one way to shut up. So one thing you do have to be able to do, and I guess this is something that I can't, I, I guess I can really train you for, but you need to be able, you need to be able to tell me how you would improve the accuracy of any measure the exam is going to give you. Um, uh, do I have another? Yeah. So if someone observes you while you work, like a manager or something, or following you around. Is this an accurate reflection of how you work? And if not, which it clearly isn't, is it? Because if your manager's following you around, you're probably going to be a better employee, for example. What I would want you to tell me is how can you actually make that more accurate, right? And the obvious answer, by the way, is for you to observe them covertly, right? So they, they don't know you're watching them. That way you're gonna get an accurate measure. So the point of psychology is to measure human behavior and we want to do this with validity, we want to do this 
accurately. So these are the types you need to know. You've got internal, external, face, concurrent, temporal, ecological, and you could probably pop population on there as well. So we're going to go through each of these describing what they are. Now, uh, from now on, in your elaborations, if you are saying, oh, therefore this theory is valid, you know, or therefore the experiment is valid, I'd want you to tell me, if you can, what type of validity you are talking about. So let's start with the first one. Internal validity, it's really, really easy. It is basically to what extent you believe the IV has affected the DV. That is what you mean by internal validity, to what extent we can confidently say the IV has affected the DV. For example, in a lab experiment, you are more sure it was actually the IV that affected the DV and not any of the confounding or extraneous variables because you have control over those extraneous and confounding variables because you're in a controlled environment. So when you have control, this is important, I would write down every word I say here, when you have control of extraneous and confounding variables, you are, as you do in a lab experiment, you are more sure that the IV has actually affected the DV. So lab experiments have high internal validity. Let me give an example. If we were, a, a, a converse example, if you will, if we were to do a field experiment on a train, that, on a public train, that we have no control over. We have no control over the temperature. We have no control over where it stops. We have no control over how many people on the carriage, for example, or where they sit. We have no control over that because we're in the real world. You, in a field experiment, you are less sure the IV has affected the DV because you, are, you cannot control for the extraneous or confounding variables. Um, and therefore, the internal validity is lower because you are less sure the IV has actually affected the DV. Um, so that's quite important, by the way. Um, in, in lab experiments, internal, uh, internal validity is high. In field experiments, it tends to be low. The opposite can be said for external validity. So if internal validity was how confident the IV has affected the DV, external validity is the extent to which the study actually represents the, the real world and how much it can be applied to it. So um, a field experiment can be applied to the real world because it literally is done in the real world like that study on the train, for example, or like the study in the college canteen, that can be applied to the real world because it literally is in the real world. So field experiments are high in external validity, but lab experiments, because they're not the real world, they're done in a lab, you know you are in a lab, you're going to behave differently in a lab. Anything in a lab does not, rep does not resemble the real world, Therefore, lab experiments, external validity tends to be low. So they work antagonistically to each other. Labs and field experiments work antagonistically to itself. Now, the, they're the two main types, right? But face validity is a way of assessing reliability, okay? It's a way that you would, it's a test you would do, very basic test, but it's a test you would do, I can't over that gift why did i put that in there that's so creepy um face validity is literally on the face of it does it measure what it claims to measure for example um that plant there actually no i'm not going to use that example um for example uh, a ruler let's just do this just do the same if I had a two meter ruler here, and if I had a two meter ruler, I'm oh, sorry, maybe a three meter ruler, and I went to measure that plant, I'd look at the ruler and I'd be like, does it look like that is gonna measure what it claims to measure? Well, it looks like it does. So therefore it has face validity. That's literally all face validity is, is does it look like it actually is going to measure something?
So the one thing to actually point out is face validity is actually quite a weak form because it's, and please note this, it's incredible. It's an incredibly subjective form of assessing validity. Uh, does it look like it's going to measure? Oh uh, yeah, I think it does. So it is quite a weak form. Ecological validity uh, is easily confused with external validity, understandably in my opinion, because they are actually very similar. One thing to to just arrow on your workbook is that ecological validity is actually a form of external validity. So it comes under external validity, but it's a bit more specific than external validity. Because if I go back, where external validity was, does the study resemble the whole world? Ecological validity is a little bit more specific. To what extent does the setting or the task relate to real life? So it's a bit more specific. Please note as well that if something has ecological validity, it tends to have external validity because they are so similar. Uh, and likewise, if one doesn't have ecological, if, if one is low ecological validity, then external validity does tend to be low as well. So a bit of a weird one, really. A bit of a weird one. I don't know why psychology hasn't updated this, to be honest. But ha, ha, ha. Um, concurrent validity. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, concurrent validity and temporal validity. So um, probably the harder ones. Probably the harder ones, especially concurrent validity. Um, but I've only written a sentence for it because, you know, that makes sense. Concurrent validity is the extent to which a, a new measure like the scores you get from a new measure actually kind of correspond and correlate with scores you get from an old and existing measure. So I'm going to give you a very, very brief, very brief example here, very brief example about autism. Now, autism is very, is very common. Uh, four to one to boy to girl, by the way. Uh, so boys are four times more likely going to get autism compared to girls. Um, but if we're talking about measuring autism, there is no test, you know, there is no one test that actually measures autism and you want obviously any analysis of someone with autism to be accurate. You'd want to be accurately diagnosed, right? So an old measure, an old measure of autism is this, it's, it's called what's called the rain story. So you have someone with suspected autism in front of you and you tell them this story. You say, right, um, I want to imagine you're sitting at home in your front room with a nice crackling fire. It's lovely, toasty, lovely, warm. You've got your blanket on you. You're very comfortable. Outside, there's a huge storm going on. Outside, there's a massive storm going on. Um, and uh, you... And you, um, it's howling to wind, et cetera, et cetera. And you see someone run past and you have, and like they've got their coat over their shoulder, their shoulder, wind blowing in their face, rain, and it's really cold as well. And you ask the person with suspected autism, how do you think that person running outside feels? And the person with autism would go, really happy, really warm, because one of the problems of autism is people struggle with what's called theory of mind and ability to put themselves in the shoes of other people, okay? Now, that's an old test. That's an old test, and it was generally valid. It was generally valid in actually measuring people's um, uh, autism. But if I uh, type in this, uh, Baron Cohen, uh, Borat's cousin, basically, it's a true story. Uh, it, he's one of the, he's the leading uh, researcher in Britain for autism. It's a weird family, isn't it? And one, you got Sasha Baron Cohen, who is basically Borat at one end of the table, and then his cousin, who's like the lead researcher of autism. But what Baron Cohen came up with was a new task, a new test, a new measure for autism that he thought might be able to measure it. Um, uh, better, for example. So what you would do is you would cut out people's eyes 
of a newspaper, I should say. Um, and you would, um, I'm trying to find a good example. Uh, you would uh, basically, oh, Bella, give it a rest, please. It's not all about you. You would basically show them just the eyes and you would have mostly two emotions down here. This one's got four for some reason, but just imagine we've just got these two. Now, uh, how do we know this is a valid measurement? How do we, Baron Cohen has just created this off the top of his head. He's an expert, doesn't mean he's actually measuring autism accurately or validly, for example, or with validity. So one thing we can do is uh, do uh, concurrent validity. So you measure the scores from this, and then you give them the old established test and see whether or not um, you're getting the same thing. So if I have someone with suspected autism in front of me and I tell them the RAIN story and they, they, they their answer suggests autism, and then I give them this, and this answer suggests autism, and if I do that to 100 people, and you know, you're, there's correspondence about 80% of the time or above, you have concurrent validity. So you concurrent validity is basically to what extent a new measure actually corresponds to what we're being told from an old measure, an right? old tried and tested. And that is basically concurrent validity. Temporal validity is a bit easier, I think. Temporal validity is basically how well the, the measure or the study or the theory, how much that is relevant today, how much it has stood the test of time. The classic example is uh, Milgram or Ash's uh, studies took place in a different time. Now, the absolutely crucial thing here that I need you, I implore you to write down is that just because it's old does not mean it's not relevant anymore. Milgram and Ash are not relevant anymore because society has moved on with its level of conformity or its level of obedience. Okay, but let me give you another example of a theory that is a hundred years older than that. Is that a fight or flight? Fight or flight is a theory that when we are confronted with a frightening experience, we either turn to it and fight and our body gets ready to fight or we run away, the blood or the blood goes to our legs and we run away. Now that theory is at least 150, 160 years old, yet it's still incredibly relevant today. And therefore fight or flight has temporal validity because it is still relevant today. Asher Milgram, much more recent than fight or flight, uh, do not have temporal validity because they are not relevant today. And you need to make this assessment. Is this theory still relevant today? Does the, uh, uh, this is a good way to phrase it, actually. Does the society in which this study was done in signif uh, differ significantly from the society we have today? Okay, uh, probably the easiest way to put that. Um, facing concurrent are ways of assessing reliability. Um, probably use actually to be fair, that's actually quite useful because if you get a question where it says, you know, "How would you assess the reliability of this experiment?" Well, you now have two ways face or concurrent validity. And that leaves us with the last bit, improving validity in experiments. Now, I can't really teach you this to be, I can't really teach you this to be perfectly honest with you. This is something that you're gonna have to do by yourself. Um, in the exam, oh, sorry, I've, again, I don't know why I'm putting these gifts in. I can't. I kind of can't take my eyes off it. <clears throat> in, the, in the exam, you may be asked to improve the validity of a 
experiment scenario they give you. Now, the reason why I can't teach this is because I don't know what scenario they're going to give you. But as a starter, I would know how to improve the validity of these three, for example, just as a starter. How do you improve the... How do you improve the validity of um, experiments? Well, you, it depends what type of validity you want, but you do it in a lab experiment maybe to improve the internal validity. You, you, um, you will, yeah, <laughs> sorry, I went a bit blank then. Uh, maybe, or uh, maybe actually, uh, one way would be you'd, you'd get a representative sample because one of the types of validity I didn't talk about was population validity. And population validity is the extent to which your sample actually represents your target or general population. Um, that would be one way to improve the validity and experiment. How do you improve? How do you improve the accuracy of questionnaires? Make it so that the questions can only be interpreted in one way. Okay, I'd say that again because it's really important to improve the validity of questionnaires. You shouldn't have to revise this. Uh, to improve the validity of questionnaires, you make the questions only interpretable or able to be interpreted in one way. How do you improve the validity of observations? Don't tell them you're watching them. Covert observation, for example. So uh, that is a few examples about how to improve the validity, standardizing the procedure for all groups. Using double blind would be even more valid, but you would need to know why, because that gets rid of experimental bias. Observations, for example, covert observations and questionnaires we have already covered in terms of making the questions only be able to be interpreted in one way. But that's pretty much it for validity. Now, um, what I would argue is, um, whilst it is important that you know all of the six or seven including population validity terms, the most important skill you need to be able to actually do is actually this. How do you improve validity? You can't do any of this without knowing all that other stuff. That you, the key skill, this is AO2, really specifically AO2, the key skill is knowing how to make any research method the exam gives you more valid. Okay, um, that is reliability and validity done. If you haven't watched a reliability video, make sure you do. Um, I need to get off this slide because that is really starting to annoy me now.